The word dharma has a wide range of meanings. Most comprehensively, it means the truth, the law, it means nature, the nature of things, the way things are. And so we could see our Dharma practice and understand our practice as learning to live in harmony with these truths, to live in harmony with nature. And the beauty and the power of the Buddha's teachings is that they lay out with such clarity and with such precision the meaning of Dharma, the meaning of nature, not as things to be believed, not as dogmas to be believed, but as truths for each one of us to explore and investigate for ourselves. They're really the guidelines and framework for our own investigation. So this exploration happens on many levels. It happens in a wise attention to our actions in the world. So we're actually paying attention in our lives. It also happens on the level of attentiveness to this mind and body process on momentary levels. So there's one quality of mind that is very closely linked with mindfulness and which has the ability or the power to enhance both of these aspects. That is our understanding of worldly activities and our understandings of this mind-body process. This quality in Pali is called Sampajana. Sampajana has been translated in different ways. Sometimes it's translated as clearly knowing or fully attentive or thoughtful, or acting with consideration, or clear comprehension. So I think that gives you some idea just of the fullness of what this quality of mind is. It's the ability to clearly know what is taking place. And so it adds the dimension of investigation and wisdom to mindfulness. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha refers to Sampajana in the very definition of Satipatthana. And so I'll just read from the Sutta. It says, Hear bhikkhus. And remember, the word bhikkhu, in its most general application, refers not only to monks or bhikkhunis to monks, to nuns, but bhikkhu in its most general application refers to anybody who is walking on the path to liberation. So the Buddha is really addressing us. Here, bhikkhus, one abides contemplating the body, and then the other three foundations, the body, feelings, the mind, and dhammas. One abides contemplating these, ardent, clearly knowing, and mindful free from desires and discontent with regard to the world. So this clear knowing, clearly knowing, each of the four fields of mindfulness is the very definition of Satipatthana. And again, later in the sutta, he particularly emphasizes this quality with regard to the mindfulness of all our daily activities. So again, this is, this is just from a little further down in the sutta, in the discourse. Again, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu is one who acts in full awareness. Full awareness, sampajana. Is one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, when looking ahead and looking around, when bending an arm or straightening, Are you practicing with Sampajana? (laughs) When wearing robes, carrying bowl, 
A bhikkhu is one who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, when defecating and urinating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. One acts with full awareness. So this is a good reminder of what our practice actually is. You know, this clearly knowing throughout the day, in the midst of all these very daily mundane activities, are we acting with this clear comprehension, with this full knowing? In some way we can understand sampajana, clearly knowing, as the foundation of our entire practice. That's how important this quality is. And there are different ways of understanding how we train ourselves in this. And so there are some very specific guidelines or teachings of how we cultivate this quality of clear comprehension. So the first way of training in acting thoughtfully, in acting with full consideration, full attention, is clearly knowing the purpose of our actions and knowing whether or not the action is of benefit to ourselves or benefit to others. So how often do we really stop and consider that before we act? Probably not that often where there's a conscious, clear comprehension. Is this action of benefit? Is it not of benefit? So this takes our meditation practice really a step further than simply being present. You know, so often, especially in kind of the contemporary spiritual scene, all of the emphasis is on, well, be present. And of course, that's essential, but it's more than simply being present. It's being present with clear comprehension. And part of it is knowing the purpose behind our actions. So here we need to see and reflect on our motivation for doing something. Is the motivation skillful? Is the motivation unskillful? So practicing this has tremendous implications for how we live our lives because our motivations are often subtle, they're often mixed, they're often a series of conflicting motivations. Unless we're saints, which some of you may be, our motivations almost assuredly, are not always completely pure. There's some mix going on. And clear comprehension really allows us to see clearly and directly, okay, what is the motivation here? I had an interesting experience of this, and it's a story I've told many times. It goes back to my time in India, which revealed how subtle our motivations can be. You know, as for those of you who've been to India, you know that one of the realities of life there is just relating to the many beggars. So I was there, and I was in the bazaar buying some fruit, and this little beggar boy came up just with his hand out, and I just took, you know, one of the pieces of an orange or something that I had just bought and gave it to him. And I was Not a big deal, it was just kind of a spontaneous thing in the moment. But then something really interesting happened. I gave him a piece of fruit, and he simply walked away without any acknowledgement at all. Not a smile, not a nod, not anything. Now, I wasn't expecting effusive thanks for this piece of orange. But when he walked away without any response at all, I realized that there was some, something in me which wanted even the barest acknowledgement. 
And it was just very interesting to see that motivation was completely hidden from me. If you had asked me whether I was expecting even that, it doesn't matter. And so when we pay attention, we see even on these very subtle levels, the complexity of our motives. And in, in the seeing of them, we can begin to cultivate those that are wholesome and see and let go of those that are not so wholesome. It takes a lot of interest, it takes a lot of clarity, it takes a lot of honesty to look clearly to with, with clear comprehension, with sampajana, at the motives behind our acts. When we can do this, when we practice doing this, it's a great ally in our daily encounters with Mara. Now, as you know, Mara in Buddhism is the embodiment of delusion. But unlike the devil or the Satan, or Satan in you know, many Western religions, you know, where he's considered lord of the underworld, in Buddhism it's really quite different. Mara is seen as the king of the devas. And his job is to keep us all ensnared in samsaric delights. So it's not the devil with the pitchfork. It's like all the ways that Mara as delusion, it's really just the personification of delusion, how he uses all these seductive and confusing ploys to accomplish our entanglement. So just a few ways, a few little things to watch out for in your daily journey through Mara's realm. Mind states that are really hindrances often come masquerading as friends, as something wholesome. Have you ever had this experience? You're feeling tired, feeling like you've really worked hard and this really compassionate voice arises in the mind. I think I need a little rest. I've really put in a lot of effort. This is really sloth and torpor masquerading as compassion. It sounds so compassionate, so, yeah, I've worked really hard. Let me just take a little rest. And of course, it's not to say that there aren't times when we do need to take rest. There are. But very often, it's really just sloth and torpor in its role of retreating from difficulties. That's, that's the function of sloth and torpor in the mind. Instead of meeting difficulties, it retreats from difficulties. But we often don't recognize it. We think that it's compassion or doubt masquerading as wisdom. You know, when there are these endless questions in the mind, questioning, am I doing it right? You know, what about this practice? Just on and on, not, not a truly investigative inquiry where we look and come to some conclusion, but just the endless proliferation of these thoughts. But it sounds like wisdom. We need to see it really for what it is which is Mara manifesting as doubt. Or Mara might entice us just with the kind of ordinary greed in the mind, simple enticement of desire. And we can see this a lot around food. You know, we have so much conditioning around food and here, of course, it's the big event of the day you know, when we go to the dining room. And so what's our mind doing? And sometimes Mara, it's amazing. And again, Mara is the embodiment of delusion, just presenting itself in so many ways. Sometimes 
it dresses up really unwholesome mind states in this fantastically alluring disguise. So, just as an example of this, on the back of uh, one book I happened to be looking at in an airport, it said, this was kind of the blurb, a novel of love, lust, passion, and greed has something for everyone. (laughs) A real delight. (laughs) And of course we are allured. So here I found it helpful to use a phrase that is found in the suttas a lot. And I, I find it very helpful in my practice in these encounters with Mara, the phrase when the Buddha or one of the great nuns or monks say, Mara, I see you. And it's almost like this wagging the finger at Mara. You know, in that moment of recognition, that moment of sampajana, where we're clearly knowing, we're clearly comprehending. This, This is Mara, this is delusion in the mind. And when we see it, when we can recognize it, it loses its power. So this aspect of clear comprehension, knowing the purpose of our actions, the motivation behind our actions, of whether they are benefit or not to ourselves or others, really rests on the understanding of the ethical foundation of the Buddha's teachings. That is, the discernment of what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. And this is very pragmatic. This is not, this is not in the context of some commandments. Wholesome means those mind states which are conducive to, which lead to happiness. Unwholesome are those mind states which lead to suffering. So it's very pragmatic, and we can test these for ourselves. So clear comprehension of purpose gives us the opportunity to make wiser choices in our lives. Now we ask ourselves, where is this action leading? Do I want to go where it's leading? Do I really want to go there? Thich Nhat Hanh, sort of his usual very incisive way, he said, Buddhism is a clever way to enjoy life. Happiness is available. Please help yourselves to it. How do we help ourselves to it? It is available. We help ourselves to it with sampajana, with clear comprehension. Although it's not explicit in the Satipatthana Sutta itself, reflection on motivation also opens the door to the practice of what in some traditions is called bodhicitta. And that is the motivation and the understanding that our practice is not for ourselves alone. That we can be practicing with the motivation to be of benefit and help to all beings, to practice for the awakening of all beings. The Dalai Lama had some wonderful words about this. He said, speaking of my own experience, I sometimes wonder why a lot of people like me. When I think about it, I cannot find in myself any specially good quality. You can just hear him saying this. (laughs) Not too many good qualities. (laughs) Except for one small thing. That is the kind heart, which I try to explain to others and which I do my best to develop myself. Of course, there are moments when I do get angry, but in the depth of my heart, I do not hold a grudge against anyone. I cannot pretend that I'm really able to practice bodhicitta, but it does give me tremendous inspiration. Deep inside me, I realize how valuable and beneficial it is. That is all. So just, 
we may have some question about his own assessment of his ability to practice it. But just that recognition that this kind heart, the aspiration to be practicing for the benefit of all, is a very precious motivation. And although these teachings on Bodhicitta were developed, further developed in the later schools of Buddhism, we also find this attitude of altruistic motivation throughout the Pali Canon. It's, it's already all there. So in one place the Buddha says, one sits with the mind set on one's own welfare, the welfare of others, and on the welfare of both, even on the welfare of the whole world. And then soon after he began teaching, and there were the first 60 disciples who became arhans. This was his exhortation to these 60 arhans. He said, go forth, O bhikkhus, for the good of the many, the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world, for the good benefit and happiness of people and devas. Let not two go by one way. Teach the Dharma excellent in the beginning, excellent in the middle, excellent in the end. Proclaim the noble life, altogether perfect and pure. Work for the good of others, you who have done your duty. Again, it's there right in the core teachings of the Buddha. This understanding of motivation, clear comprehension of purpose. One of the stories from the Buddhist time, he went to visit uh, some monks who were living in this uh, forest grove. And one of the monks was Anuruddha, who was one of the great, the great disciples of the Buddha. So the Buddha went and he met them and he asked if the monks, these few monks, were living together harmoniously. And the Venerable Anuruddha said, Why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these other venerable ones wish to do? And then each of the other monks replied in just the same way. Why should I not put aside what I want to do and do what these other venerable ones wish to do? So clearly knowing what we're doing and our motivations behind them allows us to actually be living loving-kindness rather than just doing it as a practice. It's the sampajana of purpose where we can be manifesting this quality in the way we live. Okay, so the second training in clear comprehension, the first is clearly comprehending the purpose or the motivation. The second aspect of the training is clearly knowing the suitability of an action. Because even when something is wholesome, even when something is skillful, we need to further consider, it's a further reflection, is this the right time? Is it suitable? Is this action suitable at this time? So the Buddha highlights this in many regards, but particularly in right speech, in his discussion of right speech, the basic guidelines are, is it true and is it useful? Because something may be true and not useful to say at any particular time. So we need to consider both aspects. And this is Sampajana. So something might be wholesome and still not be the suitable time to do it. So, for example, on retreat, you might understand that slowing down and paying really careful attention to each moment's experience is skillful. This is, this is a beneficial way to practice. 
But when 20 people are behind you on the lunch line, it's not necessarily the time for exploring microscopic movement. It's not suitable, even though it's skillful. And so this is another dimension we need to bring, not only, of course, into your practice here, but into our lives. And I think this just begins to give you some sense of the comprehensiveness of this quality of mind. It puts our activities into a larger context, one which takes into account the effect of our actions on others. So first, we need to look at our own motivations, the first part of clear comprehension. The second is, what is the effect on others? Is it suitable? Is it not suitable? In an interesting way, this clearly knowing the suitability can help us from getting caught up in spiritual self-images. You know, where we get caught up in some persona of how we think a spiritual person should be or should act. You know, I've spoken over the weeks of my first teacher and Kamala's teacher, Munindraji. One of my first years in India, practicing with him. Sometimes I'd be walking with him, you know, into Bodh Gaya, in the bazaar, and I would see him you know, going up to one of the guys who was selling peanuts and just haggling over five cents worth of peanuts, bargaining ferociously. And I would look at him and think, this is my teacher? <laughs> what is he doing? You know, bargaining in that way for... So as I said, my ninja said, you know, what are you doing? And he said, the practice of Dharma is to be simple, not to be a simpleton. (laughs) And he really understood in that context, in the context of India and how things were done, he understood the suitability of that action much better than I did. You know, I was holding on to some image of how, you know, a teacher is supposed to act or a Dharma practitioner is supposed to act. It was completely inappropriate to the context where he understood it. So we need to really examine, you know, and understand with Sampajana, with clear comprehension, what our motivation is. Is it suitable? So the third training in clear comprehension is knowing the proper domain for one who is practicing and meditating. And the proper domain, the the word for domain in Pali is gochara. And it literally means field or pasture. And so clear comprehension of the proper pasture, the proper field of our practice. And in talking about this kind of clear comprehension, the Buddha told a story. So I'll just read part of the story to you. It has, it has a little of the fable quality to it, since animals are speaking in the story. But there's, there's an incisive point being made. So once a hawk suddenly swooped down on a quail and seized it. Then the quail, as it was being carried off by the hawk, lamented, Oh, just my bad luck and lack of merit, that I was wandering out of my proper range and into the territory of others. If only I had kept to my proper range, my proper gochera field, today to my own ancestral territory, this, this hawk would have been no match for me in battle. But what is your proper range, the hawk asked. What is your ancestral territory? A newly plowed field with clumps of earth all turned up, replied the quail. 
So the hawk, without bragging about its own strength and without mentioning its own strength, let go of the quail and said, go quail, but even when you have gone there, you won't escape me. Then the quail, having gone to a newly plowed field with clumps of earth all turned up and climbing up on top of a large clump of earth, stood taunting the hawk. Now come and get me, you hawk. Now come and get me. So the hawk, without bragging about its own strength, without mentioning its own strength, folded its two wings and suddenly swooped down toward the quail. When the quail knew at the right time, the hawk is coming at me full speed, it slipped behind the clump of earth. And right there, the hawk hit that clump of earth and died. And then the Buddha goes on to say, this is what happens to anyone who wanders into what is not their proper range and into the territory of others. So, and he goes on in this story, and it's kind of fun to imagine the Buddha telling this. It's like a bedtime story. So he goes on to say, what is not the proper domain? What is not the proper gochara field for practicing yogis? And he said, it's wandering in the five strands of sense pleasures. When the mind gets lost in sights and sounds and smells and tastes and different sensations. When the mind is getting lost in the five strands of sense pleasures. And he says that are agreeable, pleasing, charming, endearing, fostering desire, enticing. That is not the proper domain for a yogi. And the Buddha went on to say, what is the proper domain? The proper pastures for awakening. And they're precisely the four satipatthanas. What for? And this is the rest of that sutta. There is the case where a bhikkhu remains focused on the body in and of itself. Ardent, clearly knowing, and mindful. Putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Bhikkhu remains focused on feelings, on mind, on mental qualities, in and of themselves, ardent, clearly knowing, and mindful. Putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. For a bhikkhu, this is one's proper range, one's own ancestral territory. So you might think of just the hawk and the quail as we're in this world of sense objects. That's not going to disappear. This is our world. But are we in the proper domain that is paying attention, being mindful, clearly knowing of what's arising, or have we gone outside of our domain into the enticement, the pleasure, the agreeableness, being lost in the world of sense objects? This is clear comprehension. This is clearly knowing the proper domain of practice. So we need to consider this. We need to be watching. If we keep this aspect of clear comprehension in mind, it helps us to not get distracted, keeps us more on track. You know, are we mindful of thoughts as thoughts rather than getting lost in them? Or are we getting carried away by all the stories and dramas of our minds? There's one story of a monk who every time he did something unmindfully, he went back and did the activity again. He did the action again. He retraced that action with awareness. And it said that after he practiced that way for 20 years, he became an arhant. I really like that story, both for its suggestion as a way to practice. 
And just imagine doing that. And also because it highlights the level of dedicated commitment we need for awakening. You know, there's, there's a certain power and inspiration and also great patience when we realize that this transformation of consciousness, you know, the fulfillment of the path of freedom, it takes time. Unlike the person who wrote to IMS addressing the letter to the Instant Meditation Society, (laughs) which actually happened, it is not an instant process. We're really talking about talking about this transformation of mind and working with patterns that are very deeply conditioned and deeply rooted. So this practice of retracing one's steps, you know, one's actions, whenever you do something unmindfully, it might be interesting just to experiment with that, if not for 20 years, even for just a short time, you know, just to see what it's like and to see whether practicing in that way actually makes you more mindful, more continuous mindful. Knowing that if you're not, (laughs) you're going to have to go back and do the same thing again. And it would be interesting to see what your record is for how many times you need to go back before actually being mindful, you know, throughout an activity. So again, it's just a way of either holding it as a thought experiment or actually just playing with it a little bit and seeing the effect on your practice. You know, this aspect of clear comprehension, of understanding the proper domain of practice, which are the four foundations of mindfulness, it really points to the importance of sense restraint so that the mind is not just going out continually through the eye door and through the ear door and the body door. You know, where we're really, as the Buddha often says in the suttas, guarding the sense doors, not in a, not a contracted way, not in a fearful way, but just being mindful, being attentive. But as we know, sense restraint or renunciation is not something that is really very highly regarded in our culture. It's not a value. And probably for most of us, or many of us, even the words don't really make our hearts jump with delight. You know, we may think or even know, yes, it's a good idea, and it would probably be good for us, but it almost feels burdensome to exercise sense restraint. It's interesting, though, if we just change the terminology and instead of thinking of it as renunciation, we think of it as non-addiction. Non-addiction to different sense objects. Just the different terminology suggests the freedom of that. How free the mind is when it's not continually going out. Like everything else, this clearly knowing the domain of practice, this clear comprehension, requires practice because it goes against some deeply conditioned patterns of sense indulgence. I had a a very striking example of proper domain and improper domain. One retreat I was on here at the Forest Refuge. I was sitting, and my yogi job was putting the tea things away. So, you know, every evening at tea, I would gather all the stuff, put it away, and one evening, I went into the walk-in refrigerator, putting some of the things away, and I saw this big box of grapes. And the grapes had been out. 
you know, on the table, but they were already in the walk-in and just, oh, they look good. <laughs> and my hand went to the grapes and I started eating a few. And then I started looking around furtively, you know, is anybody watching me? <laughs> and 